Good afternoon and welcome to this talk. Oh, this is real loud. Um, so welcome to this Beetroot talk. Uh, my name is Thomas and let me introduce myself. I'm the CTO and one of the embedded Linux engineers at Free Electrons. We do embedded Linux consulting, Linux kernel development, bootloader development and build system work. I do work on the Linux kernel, mainly around Marvel platforms. I do also contribute quite a bit to Beetroot, which is going to be the topic of today's talk. I live in the southwest of France, but you've already noticed my terrible accent. And uh, when I'm not doing Buildroot stuff, I do windsurfing and snowboarding. So before we get started, um, let's have a quick poll. Um, who already knows about Buildroot? Okay, almost the entire room. Who is already using Buildroot? Uh, okay, quite a few people. Who is using Open Embedded? Uh, oh, still half of the room. Open WRT or yeah, quite a few people. Okay, another build system. <laughs> okay, you weird people. Okay, thanks. Um, so most of you know build roots. I'm gonna go pretty quickly over that. Uh, it's an embedded Linux build system. So the idea is that we have. Um, uh, source code for a number of uh, um, software components, the Linux kernel, the bootloader, uh, perhaps BuzzyBox, um, uh, graphical libraries, network libraries, a bunch of applications, and we want to cross-compile everything and generate a root file system image that you can put on your embedded device. Uh, so that's what a build system is all about. And um, uh, build root tries to be uh, fast and simple. That's uh, clearly the, the the main two goals, and uh, it's. Uh, it's try to be easy to use and understand. So we use kconfig to describe the configuration of the system. So you run make menu config and you can set what is your target architecture, uh, what components you want in your system, which kernel version you want, the kernel configuration. It's all saved in a nice .config file. So it's very um, familiar to people doing a little bit of Linux kernel development or uh, at least using the Linux kernel. And then you run make and it goes and downloads everything that's needed, builds a tool chain, builds your kernel, builds all the user space components, puts all that together and creates a root file system image out of it. We generate by default a pretty small file system, uh, two megs. So if you do the default build root build, you get a two megabyte file system with just BuzzyBox and UserLipsy. So it's, uh, you can start small and then uh, based on that add whatever package you want. So we've got uh, more than 2000 packages nowadays, um, ranging from uh, small things like BuzzyBox all the way up to a full x.org stack, GStreamer, Qt, and many other things. We generate file system images. So contrary to uh, OE or Yocto, we generate uh, complete distributions with binary packages. We really do only generate like a ext2 image or a ubifs image or whatever file system you like without any uh, package management system. So if you want to do upgrades, you do a full system upgrade. Uh, it's a vendor neutral tool. It's uh, maintained by an open source community with lots of um, uh, contributors originating from different companies. Um, the community is very active and I have some graphs about that in a few slides. Uh, we do uh, stable releases every three months and we've been doing that for since 2009, so it's been quite a while. And uh, the project has started in 2001, which makes it, I believe, the oldest still maintained build system. So we've been around for a while. So I made this talk um, about three and a half years ago at ELC in the US in uh, 2014. And so I thought, oh, it's been a while that we haven't uh, presented what uh, were the new features and improvements in Beetroot. And when you uh, make the summary, there's a fair number of them. So I submitted that talk and it uh, luckily got accepted. So I wanted to share um, a few details about like the project activity, the release schedule, um, the uh, improvements in terms of architecture support, toolchain support in the core Beetroot infrastructure, testing improvements as well, and a, a few other details. So moving on with the first topic, project activity. This shows the number of commits per month, um, sorry, per uh, release here. Uh, so for every release, we've got approximately between 1,000 and 1,500 commits. Um, and as I said, we uh, produce a release every three months. So it's a fairly active uh, project. We get uh, lots of um, um, activity and, and contributors. So the contributor number is about 100 people uh, contributing to each release. Uh, it's nowadays a little bit more more than that, but um, yeah, 110, 120 sometimes, um, contributing every every three months to uh, to the release. So it's certainly a different scale than the, the Linux kernel, but it makes it a fairly active um, um, 
medium-sized open source project. We've got um, a pretty serious uh, mailing list activity, um, over 2,000 email um, per month on, on the mailing list. So it's, uh, if you subscribe to the mailing list, you get a good and nice flood of uh, emails in your inbox every day. And looking at the number of packages since um, the last five years, so we started with less than a thousand packages uh, five years ago, and we know of more than two thousand of them. And we encourage um, a lot of people to contribute their packages upstream. Um, we don't really encourage the model of um, uh, separate layers like uh, Open Embedded is, is encouraging. We prefer to have all the packages upstream to increase the, the review and improve the quality of them, which is why this um, package number is growing and continues to grow over time. Um, speaking of the release schedule, so since 2009, we've done we've been doing releases every three months. Uh, so it's pretty pretty easy. One in February, one in May, one in August, and one in November. And we never skipped a release or missed a, a release date except by a few days at most. So it's pretty impressive for a, a purely open source uh, driven project. So until now. Um, we were um, sometimes doing point releases for the latest stable release as a way of fixing a few bugs, a few issues, but with there were no long-term maintained um, uh, versions. So if you wanted to get uh, security fixes, uh, bug fixes, build fixes, basically your only option was either to do the backport yourself or upgrade to a completely new release, which means upgrading everything in your system, which is not always possible. So since um, 2017 uh, 2 we decided to have an LTS release. So every 2 release is going to be for no maintained for one year. We'll see if other people volunteers to extend that, but that's a start, uh, which is going to be maintained for security build and bug fixes. So there have already been six point releases since um, 2017 2 um, so dot one, dot two, three, four, five, six in April, May, June, July, two times in September, so almost one per month. We've done about 500 commits there, uh, amongst which about, let's say, a third, uh, where security updates, security fixes. And this is mainly done by uh, the original project maintainer, Peter Kosgaard, who sits r right here. And we're seeing more and more people interested in that. And so if you use uh, BuildRoot into devices that you don't want to, um, well, fully upgrade, um, um, every three few months, perhaps uh, looking at this LTS release is, is interesting. And obviously the next one will be uh, 2018 or two. In terms of maintenance, there has been a few uh, changes over the last um, years. We used to have a single uh, committer um, as acting as the project maintainer. So that's Peter guy sitting still here, he hasn't moved. And uh, because of this um, increase of uh, contributors and contributions, we added two other committers. Um, so it was me first, and then Arnaud uh, joined, who is sitting just here. And we also have no physical meetings that we held uh, pretty much three times a year. So we had a, a meeting um, just last weekend before that conference, and you can see a, a few people here working on, on, on build routes, and we have one after FOSDEM, and we now have one more private hackathon between the core developers in the summer, so that helps um, uh, make uh, build route move forward. Architecture support, I think, but I haven't checked really, but I think we're probably the build system supporting the largest number of architectures, um, ranging from the well-known ones, uh, ARM, uh, of course, uh, x86 and then Power PC and MIPS, but also more like specialized architecture or less known architectures. Um, thinking like now is to Microblaze, OpenRisk, uh, Arc, SuperH, and a bunch of others. Um, so it's pretty impressive, and we've got a number of contributors interested in those uh, more specialized um, architectures. So it's a nice thing. So in, in recent years, what has been improved on the architecture uh, side is the addition for no MMU ARM support. So we know can build systems for the uh, Cortex-M3 and Cortex-M4 microcontrollers that can run a Linux system. We've done a, a bunch of improvements on the ARM, ARM64 support so that you can now uh, select uh, the ARM64 core that you're using and decide if you want to run a 64-bit system or a 32-bit system on it. Um, IBM has contributed support for PowerPC64, both Slayton and Beginian. So it's nice to see that the um, the company doing the, the the architecture is directly contributing to the to the project. 
Uh, there has been also a lot of MIPS related improvement with imagination technologies making some efforts to push forward this architecture. We've received lots of contributions from them. Uh, so adding uh, MIPS uh, 32R6 and MIPS 64R6 support and uh, adding more fine grain uh, MIPS core selection and things like that. We've added support for um, uh, completely, um, well, not new architectures, but architecture that were new to build roots, OpenRIS, Cisky, and Spark 64, uh, completely new. Um, uh, the uh, support for M68K was, um, well, kind of re-enabled. It, it was there, but it was marked broken for ages, and it was um, uh, fixed and, and uh, re-enabled. We've um, enabled support for Blackfin and Microblaze with the UCLOPC CNG support, and I'm going to get back to that in the next slides. And we also tend to drop uh, features for that are no longer being used of architectures like AVR32, which was also dropped from the kernel uh, recently, and SH64, which never really well materialized in the real world, uh, were dropped. So quite a few changes there, extending our architecture support. On the toolchain side. Um, BuildRoot supports two kind of mechanisms to um, either produce or use a toolchain. So we can either build our own toolchain, in which case BuildRoot will go and, 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 and build binutils and then uh, build the um, first stage GCC and build, build C library, build the final uh, GCC and all the, the related libraries. So that's one way of doing things, which we call the internal toolchain backend. And on the other side, BuildRoot can use existing toolchains. So if you have a Linaro toolchain around or a a uh, toolchain provided by your vendor, you can just tell your root, here is my toolchain and it can, it can use it. That's what we call the external toolchain backend. On the internal toolchain side, we added support for Muscle, the uh, C library that is, uh, I think, growing in popularity. We moved away from UCLipsy, which was pretty much a dead project, to UCLipsy NG, which is a fork of UCLipsy that is actively maintained. And uh, a number of the improvements uh, on the architecture support that I mentioned on the previous slides were contributed to build root by the uh, UCLIP CNG maintainer. So that's uh, also a nice thing. All the different components uh, for the toolchain are really regularly updated. So we now have uh, GCC7 support, Binutils 2.29, GDB8, GLIPC 2.26, which are basically the latest versions that you can find. But we are a little bit conservative and um, we use by default always the version that's uh, the one before the latest. So our default GCC version is 6, Pinot 6, 228, and uh, uh, GDB 7.12. We've added LTO, so link, link time optimization support, and Fortran support. Yes, there are still some people interested in that. Um, we uh, add a toolchain wrapper, so it's a kind of a C program that uh, is replaces GCC and, and calls GCC itself, but does additional checks. We already add that for the external toolchain and we extended that for the internal toolchain. And one of the things that it does is it checks if you don't have a header pass or library pass that point to host libraries. And it helps detect uh, well, cross compilation issues before they happen. If you're cross compiling something but try to link with host libraries or use host headers, there's something wrong going on. So the wrapper says, ooh, something bad is happening here. We removed support for eglipc because nowadays glipc has picked up everything that eglipc was doing. On the external toolchain side, um, I think there were somewhat less improvements in this area. Um, one big change is more internal. It's how it's organized in build roots. The external toolchain support used to be like one big package supporting all the possible toolchains, but it started to be a little bit of a mess. So we split that into multiple packages, one per external toolchain. Uh, family, so we have one for Linaro ARM, one for Linaro Ar ARM64, one uh, for I don't know um, code sorcery toolchains, and so on and so forth. So it's more uh, easily maintainable, but it doesn't change much the functionality visible to to the user. Um, we uh, improved the wrapper that I said already existed for other reasons to do the sanity checking of header and library pass exactly like for the internal backend. And we updated the toolchains to use more recent versions of Linaro sorcery toolchains. We've got a toolchain from Imagination t uh, Technologies and from Synopsis for the ARC architecture, removed a bunch of old toolchains that were no longer maintained, so the usual maintenance uh, thing. Um, a side project um, that is in somewhat independent from BuildRoot but uses it uh, is related to this toolchain work. So it's uh, toolchains.freelections.com. It's a website where you can uh, select your architecture, select the GLIPC, uh, the sorry, the C library that you want. So it can be GLIPC, UCLIPC, or Muscle. And it has um, a lot of pre-compiled toolchain that are freely available. So we have uh, 34 
different architecture and variants supported at the moment, um, multiplied by more or less three C libraries, multiplied by two versions. So we have a stable version and a bleeding edge version for each toolchain. So it makes, I think, total 130 or something like that toolchains that are available. You click and you have a pre-built toolchain available for that, for that platform. Those toolchains are almost all of them tested um, by building a Linux kernel and booting it in QMU, and all of that is done automatically in the CI environment, so it's done in, on GitLab CI. So it's a new source for um, a free available uh, pre-built toolchains that you can leverage for your projects to save uh, build time. Uh, on the infrastructure side, I think perhaps the most um, one of the most interesting change that happened is the relocatable SDK. So in build roots, when you build, there's one of the output folder is output host, which contains two things. It contains the native tools, so the binary programs that run on your build machine, which includes the cross compilers and a bunch of other programs. And it also contains the toolchain sysroots, which are all the headers and libraries that have been cross compiled for the target so that the cross compiler can find them to build other libraries or appli other applications for the target. So basically, this output host, if you take it and give it to someone else, he has the cross-compiler and all the libraries and, and files that allow uh, this developer to compile applications that can run on the root file system produced by BuildRoot. So essentially, it is an SDK, it's a software development kit. The problem we had so far is that this output host thing was not relocatable. So you could use it if you left it at the same uh, absolute path, but if you moved it around in your system or in, on another machine, it wouldn't work. So um, we've got a bunch of contributions there to improve that situation. And we know we have a target called make SDK that kind of post-processes output host and makes it um, something that is ready to be relocatable. So it adjusts the R pass encoded into the uh, native binaries to be relative R pass, so that allows them to be moved around. And it also installs a shell script that uh, SDK users have to run once they have installed the um, SDK on their system to fix up the remaining absolute paths because there are still a bunch of them, but at least we have a fix up uh, logic um, happening here. So that's uh, pretty nice. Related to that, we used to have a, all the um, native tools and sysroot down in host user and then in there without anything directly under host beside this user folder. So we moved everything up so that the SDK no more looks more like any other tool chain that you can find elsewhere. And th since we were cleaning up the native binaries R path, we also um, took this opportunity to do a bunch of cleaning on the target binaries R path. So that's not related to being relocatable, but just avoiding having R path referring to build machine locations, which don't make sense on the target. Another useful improvement is the introduction of hashes uh, to um, basically validate the integrity of files that are uh, downloaded. So each package can now contain a package.hash file next to a config.in file that describes the config options for the package and the make file that describes how to build that package. We have a hash file. And it, you can put the hashes in there for the tarball for the patches that are downloaded by the package, if there's any, and you can also put the hashes for the license files that are inside the tarball itself, so that we can detect if there's a change in the license text. Um, so those hashes are checked when the package is extracted, so every time you do a build, it will, before extracting, check the hash. So even if the, the tarball was downloaded correctly, but was later modified for some reason on your file system, it's going to detect it at build time. The license file hashes are checked when you generate the licensing information. So BuildRoot has a you know, license reporting infrastructure. So you run make legal info and it collects all the license information for all the packages that you have enabled and produces a lot of um, things that ease uh, the license compliance. So it puts all the source code in one place, the license tag in another, and then you can um, give that to your, um, to your customers to comply with the different licenses. So as I said, it allows to check the integrity of downloads, um, that locally stored tarballs have not been modified, detect if license terms have, have changed, um, and also it allows us to detect if upstream sometimes um, re-uploads a, a tarball that is different, but with the same name, and some open source projects do this terrible thing, so we can detect that and, and tell upstream, oh, you're doing something wrong here, you re-uploaded, I don't know, foobar109, you should make a new release instead of replacing a, an older one. And we now have uh, almost all of the packages with uh, hash files, so the numbers here are here, there are just a few uh, dozens of packages missing, but the vast majority of hash files by now. 
So we do a licensing report, as I said, this was this already existed uh, three years ago, but there have been a few improvements in there. We now use SPDX license code to make uh, those information more easily uh, parsable and, 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 and well, use basically a kind of a standard here to describe licenses. As I said, we, we added ashes for license files. We added a feature to support storing the source code of uh, binary artifacts, and typically that's the case for uh, pre-built toolchain. A pre-built toolchain is a bunch of binaries uh, that you download, so the package source points to a something that is in fact binary. But to comply with the, s the um, license, you want to also provide the source code for that, so there is a, a new package variable called actual source, which can you can point to the actual source code, so if there is a tarball containing the toolchain binary and the tarball containing the toolchain source, you can tell Bitroot about both and it will use the second one for uh, license compliance. We've added a lot of license annotations into our packages up to the point where almost all of them have license annotation. By now there's about a hundred, less than a hundred um, that still lack license annotation and people are working on that continuously. Continuing on the infrastructure side, uh, BR2 external is a feature that allows um, users to implement package recipes, store um, dev configs or build root configurations and other build related files and configuration files outside of the build root tree. So you can have the build root tree pretty much unchanged and keep all your modifications separate, which can be convenient in a number of situations. So you can separate your project company specific stuff separate from the build root tree. You can update build root more easily this way and you can perhaps separate things more cleanly. It's kind of a simplified form of the layer concept that the OE and, and Yocto projects and oh, I think also OpenWRT has. It, it, isn't, it isn't as powerful as what Yocto and OE allows to do, but it provides some of the features. So it's been available since uh, uh, a bit more than three years, but it has been improved. And the main improvements have been uh, the ability to have multiple um, PR2 external directories. It used to be that you can only have one, and now you can have several. So if you want to separate things into a well more fine grain than just build root and the rest, uh, now you can have multiple things separately. And we've also improved it, uh, improved the mechanism, so you can not only have regular packages but also bootloader packages and file system image um, formats su supported in your BR2 external. So just make that feature a little bit more usable. On the package infrastructure side, uh, lots of things have uh, improved there. So what we call package infrastructures are is the, the makefile logic that controls how packages are built. So there's a base infrastructure that basically handles how packages are uh, downloaded, extracted, and patched. And then you can use this base infrastructure if your package has a kind of a weird, um, non very standardized build system like a handwritten make file or a shell script. So you have to describe manually how to configure, build, and install this package. But fortunately, most of the uh, open source software use um, well defined build systems, the auto tools you make, and, or other things. So we have specialized package infrastructures that define how to configure, build, and install packages. So you have, don't have to repeat this description for each and every package. So we already had a number of these, like I said, AutoTools, CMake, Python, that already existed. But a number of them were improved or added. So we improved the Python packet infrastructure to support Python 3.x. And when then we added a number of other packet infrastructures. So I'm going to mention Perl, WAF, Rebar for, well, respectively, Perl, WAF, and Erlang packages. Virtual package is kind of special. It's a package to uh, infrastructure to describe virtual packages. And it's typically used for OpenGL because we have multiple OpenGL implementations typically provided by hardware vendors. So we wanted to create an indirection between the consumers of the OpenGL API and the providers of the OpenGL API so that each consumer of OpenGL API doesn't have to know about each every possible provider. So they say, I need OpenGL, and then they are the provider says, I provide OpenGL, and the virtual package infrastructure in the middle is here to make sure that everybody finds each other. So it works well, and uh, we've had uh, more and more OpenGL uh, implementations packaged in build roots for a number of platforms. Uh, perhaps I mentioned kconfig package, a small infrastructure that uh, complements generic package to support running make mini config and make safe dev config for all those um, well-known software components such as Linux, Buzzybox, Uselipsy, Bearbox, Uboot that use kconfig. Um, another one was added for helping with building kernel modules. So there are a bunch of packages that not only build user space code, but also kernel modules. So that 
can be standardized a little bit. So all of those things were um, happened over the last uh, the last years. Sure, please. Yes, um, true. So um, so the plans is uh, pretty much like in every open source project. They are defined by the patches we receive. And there have been patches already sent for Rust, and uh, they have been um, going through a number of iterations, and I hope at some point it will uh, settle and, and end up into something that can be merged. So yes, it's somewhere on the radar, um, but it's not too actively pushed at the moment, so if there is some interest, I believe more help would be definitely welcome. Yep, thanks. So moving on, um, graphing. Uh, we already have a bunch of uh, um, graphing capabilities to analyze the system that you produce with build root. Um, mainly dependency graphs and build time graphs. We added uh, file system size graphs looking like this. So you can know per package what is um, well, what is the contribution of each package to the whole file system size. So if you want to reduce the size of your file system, you know, oh, Qt is uh, the one at fault, obviously. Um, and you can also do um, Reverse dependency graph, so like um, um, who is depending on uh, libglib2, so those are the, 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 the packages that require libglib2, so if I want to get rid of libglib2 because it's taking up too much space, for example, then I have to figure out why if I really need all of those packages, so it's pretty much the same, the reverse of uh, dependency graph. So that can be really, really helpful to analyze what's in your system, especially when it becomes a slightly complicated system. We did a little bit of restructuring around the skeleton. Um, the skeleton is the base of the root file system. It's the um, basically the uh, base unit hierarchy plus a bunch of uh, init scripts and, and uh, ET files in etc that gets copied to the target before any other package uh, adds binaries and, and libraries in there. And we split that into multiple uh, packages mainly to uh, support more correctly various init systems, uh, build root supports, um, um, the buzzy box init, which is used by default, uh, sysv init, um, systemd as an init system, and so we split the skeleton into a common part that's common to all init systems and then um, split it in, into uh, separate packages, the part that's more systemd specific or more uh, buzzy box sysv init specific. Um, so this allowed to avoid having sysv related craft um, in a system the enabled system or the opposite. It allowed to implement properly read-only support for uh, read-only rootfs support with systemd, which was uh, something that was not working properly uh, back then. And we also added support for merge user, so where where uh, user bin is the same as bin and user as bin is the same as bin, which is kind of a requirement for systemd. So that was added as well as part of this like overall effort. So it's um, pretty good, and I think the last piece is just landed in, in that summer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you for the precision. Um, file system support. Um, I think there's been less things going on in this area. So this is the part that um, uh, takes place at the very end of the build. You have uh, built all your packages. They're in the target directory, and you want to create the final file system image that you can deploy on your uh, embedded system. So we now use mkfs.ext234 to generate those corresponding file system instead of gen.ext2fs. It allows to support somewhat, I would say, simplify better ext3, ext4 images. Um, someone contributed support for AXFS, so apparently using that. We improved the ISO 9660 support for people who generate uh, uh, bootable USB keys or uh, CD-ROMs. But I think the main thing that's um, changed is the uh, generalization of using GenImage. So it's a tool developed by uh, Pengutronics that allows to generate easily a complete SD card or MMC image for um, a system, so you can describe the different partitions, what they should contain, it just creates that. And this way you can just DD that image to your SD card without having to manually create the partitions and their, uh, put their content, so it's pretty nice. And we also added a way of having a custom script that runs within the fake root run environment, so that's an environment in, the in, in which we create the file system image, so it pretends we run as root, which allows us to adjust permissions and, and uh, various things on the files. Um, 
and, and which then have an effect on the uh, file system image that's being produced. Until now, it was uh, like very fixed, and uh, uh, thanks to that, it's possible for people to have some custom logic edits inside the fake root environment to adju further adjust permissions, ownership, um, I don't know, extended attributes and stuff in inside the, the fake root environment. So it's more flexibility added. We already had a script that runs before the file system image is created, um, after the file system image is created, and we now have uh, one running when the image uh, uh, file system image is created for adding flexibility. Um, reproducible build support was added. Um, so the idea is to you make two builds of the same configuration and you get a binary identical results. Um, so it's only the beginning that uh, was done, um, and making sure that timestamps don't creep into the binaries and making sure that the order of the files is always the same and, and stuff like that. So we are far from having something um, um, that is complete and that will, in all cases, generate a reproducible build, but it's the first step and we uh, very much welcome additional contribution in this area. And definitely the developers who started this effort are no longer active, so uh, there's a, a room for improvement there. Packages side, packages have been updated a lot. We've added a thousand packages in the last three years and there have been uh, improvements in many areas. Uh, things like SLinux was support was added, uh, Kodi, Go, Mono was added, uh, a gazillion uh, packages for Python modules, per modules, and, and many other things. Um, support for hardware was, uh, was improved with mainly OpenGL um, enabling and lots of other things as well. Another big area where we improve things is um, testing and CI and quality. So we've added a runtime testing infrastructure that's pretty new, just uh, merged, I think, uh, this spring and then improved this summer. Uh, so the idea of runtime testing is that we were doing build time testing so far. So take a build root configuration, it builds, cool, but perhaps it doesn't run at all. So what we've done is a write a small Python test infrastructure which allows us to, to describe a bit root configuration. So this one just builds a drop bear, SSH client and server, and then describe what we want to do with it. So we boot it in our QMU and we make sure that uh, apparently an SSH server is running. So this test is very, very simple. And some other tests we have are more complicated. And so we're trying to uh, make this uh, testing infrastructure grow a little bit to test more um, features of, of build root and make sure that they don't break. So we already had autobuild.buildroot.org, which um, had been running for a while, but uh, interestingly suffered a hard disk crash uh, on Friday before I left for, uh, for Prague. Um, so we used to have something like 200,000 build results on there accumulated over the years, and now it's down to a few hundreds because it started again um, like on Friday. Um, so the idea here is that we choose a random architectural toolchain configuration, a random selection of packages, we build that and we see if it uh, works or not. And that allows to detect a lot of dependency problems, a lot of uh, architecture specific issues and stuff like that. So it really helped us you know, improve the, the quality of build routes that's still running. Um, but we've done a bunch of improvements, mainly running uh, the build of all our dev configs. So we have dev configs for a lot of uh, development boards, uh, evaluation boards from various vendors. So people can just uh, build a well-known working system and, and for uh, you know, Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone or QMU or a bunch of other platforms. So we build all of them weekly on, on GitLab CI. We also run the runtime test on GitLab CI. So same thing, we're trying to improve the CI. Uh, we are preparing auto-build uh, support for testing multiple branches and mainly do that on the LTS branch. That's not ongoing at the moment and that's something we want to fix. Um, so that there's been already some preparation work and more is, is going to happen. And we've also improved the uh, auto-build effort by sending uh, notifications to the specific developers responsible for given packages or architectures. So it's related to this work here, developer's file. It's uh, for those of you who work on the kernel, uh, we have a maintainer's file in the kernel and developer's file in Buildroot is pretty much the same. Uh, so it says who is uh, interested or in charge of this architecture or this package. And thanks to that, Autobuild knows, okay, if this package breaks, then I can email that person and, and say, oh, your package broke on that architecture in that condition, can you please fix it? And we Im introduced a number of other tools to uh, detect uh, coding style mistakes, to easily test a package on a large number of uh, toolchain and architecture combinations, a tool to generate Python packages, so a lot of tooling going on around um, a build itself. 
Um, other improvements that came up to my mind and couldn't really fit in any of the other categories, we've improved support for what we call Linux extensions. So it's um, features that are not in Linux upstream but require uh, patching Linux, so like uh, Xenomai or RTAI or a bunch of uh, specific drivers. So we've improved a little bit how this is handled and it should be a little bit better now. We've added support for user space tools that are part of the kernel tree itself, so things like perf or um, team one or uh, self-test and a few other things. Uh, so it's no easier to build them as well. We've uh, reorganized completely our get text since handled. Uh, it was a bit messy and now it's uh, much clearer. We have a, a system-wide Boolean that says I want to support translations or I don't. Uh, which is off by default, but if you really need translation in your system, you can enable that, and that had implication of, on lots of packages and helped us solve a number of uh, build issues we had. We've also added checks on the architecture of cross-compiled binaries. So if you build a system for ARM, we make sure that each and every uh, binary on the root file system is really built for ARM, and that also helped detect um, a few, a small number of packages that were uh, a little bit broken in that respect. What's on the radar? Um, on the radar, we have, uh, of course, lots of other things, but it's kind of the main um, uh, features that I, uh, I found useful. Uh, the git download cache. So today, if you, in a build root package, say, I want to download from a git repository, it will do a clone, um, but only keep the version that you selected into a tarball. And if you change the version, it will basically clone again the git repository entirely. So you do an upgrade of just one commit, and you redownload the entire kernel tree, which is super annoying. So what we want to do is we want to keep a cache of the Git repository locally, so that when you update the, the tag or, uh, or the hash of the commit, it can use the, all the objects that it has locally. So the uh, patches have already been posted for that. They are not completely ready for merging, but it's a very good start. We want to do per package out of tree build. So you can do a complete out of tree build in build root where you have the source code of build root on one side and then multiple projects side by side. But we want to do that inside build root on a per package basis. And the main reason motivation for that is to avoid rsync uh, the source tree when you're using a feature like override source dir, which is, uh, we were discussing this feature right before the talk, which is a nice feature when you're doing active development in a package. You don't want BuildRoot to download the package. You want to BuildRoot to use the source code that is locally available that you have on your machine. And right now, BuildRoot is rsyncing the, the, the entire source tree, which is a little bit annoying. So we want to do out of tree build for uh, such situations. Another big feature that um, we discussed at uh, the meeting this weekend is a top level parallel build. So right now, BuildRoot builds the different packages sequentially. So it uses make minus j something inside the build of each package to take advantage of multiple CPU cores, but it doesn't build different packages in parallel. So that's something we want to do, but we want to do it right, and doing it right is not as easy as, as it sounds. Uh, we need uh, per package staging and host directories and uh, probably per, per package targets, uh, have some locking in some places, so it's, uh, it's, it's not that easy, uh, but hopefully we'll, we'll get there at some point. And another thing that's um, on the radar are uh, more packet infrastructures, and the two that came to mind that were already posted were uh, packet infrastructure for Go and Mason. So Rust was not on my list, but it, um, uh, like support for the language is, is has also been posted uh, a while ago. So basically, what I think the, the key takeaways are: uh, uh, it's an active project. Um, um, emails every day on the mailing list, patches applied every, pretty much every day. Uh, we now have LTI, LTS releases. I think that's a very, very big improvement for uh, for the, uh, the usefulness of build root in, in uh, embedded uh, devices. Relocatable SDK for uh, application developers, um, updates to our package sets, but in, uh, both in the number of packages and also in the fact that they are being constantly updated. A better um, testing effort. It's, um, could of course be better, like all testing efforts, I guess, but it's uh, the, the improvements have been uh, pretty interesting in this area. And uh, so interesting new features in the roadmap, uh, top level parallel build, git cache, things like that, I think are uh, really nice. Hopefully that leaves a little bit of time for questions, if you have any. I have a microphone here. Questions, anyone? Do you already support uh, build of uh, uh, modified existing modified package in uh, out of tree, or are you going to be supporting? 
this is, was one of your la latest. Uh, so, um, what we support today uh, with this, let me go back to this line, override source there. Yeah. We support that for every package. You can write a file called local.mk with as many override source there statements. So if you write, for example, Linux override source there equal and then, I don't know, slash home, blah, 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 Linux, what Buildroot is going to do is that when it's going to build the Linux package, instead of doing the normal download extract patch steps, it's going to skip those three steps and replace them by rsync from the folder that you specified to output build Linux. And then it's going to move on with the regular configure, build, and install steps. And then if you run something like make Linux dash rebuild, it's going to do the rsync again. Since it has already been rsync once, it's going to just copy the file, the few files that you modified, and run the build step and the install step again. So basically, if you're doing um, like a development uh, workflow where you make a change in your, in your Linux tree and you do make Linux rebuild, it just rebuilds the one file that you've changed, redeploys the, tar the kernel image, and you can regenerate your root file system image if you want to. So that's that's the development workflow that you can have, and your Linux tree is is unchanged. Build root will not touch it, so it can be like uh, version control under Git. You can move from one branch to the other, do commits, git diffs, whatever you want there. Another question here. Thank you. First off, uh, thank you very much for BuildRoot. Been using it for years, love it, and it keeps getting better. So Thanks. First off, a big thank you. One thing I struggle with quite a lot is um, the, the sort of convergence between uh, a package built for the target and the package built because you want to use it as part of your boot infrastructure. So for example, uh, a bootable USB, you want to use um, ISO Linux or something like that. But I actually want to build ISO Linux also as a target. And the package configuration system at the moment, I, it sounds like you've made some good improvements here, particularly with the BR2 external, moving of boot into there. But I know people have put forward package, um, <coughs> sorry, put forward patches for Grub2 to build for target, as well as building for boot. Have you got a, po it, uh, you've never seemed to want to accept those patches, but you've been happy to send them out to people who ask for them. Are you going to approach that? Have you, have you got a plan to do that consistently, or is, is that still a no-go from you guys? So for the Grub2 case, indeed, there have been patches, and one of the, the, the guys who participated to the, to the meeting last weekend was working precisely in that topic, separating more cleanly the tools that we build for the host and the tools that we build for the targets. And the build system of bootloaders is always a little bit messy in that respect. Um, so perhaps the Syslinux uh, state of, of affairs is not uh, completely great today, and it is definitely possible to improve it by having host Syslinux that would build just the host tools, and then the target Syslinux that would build only the target, uh, the kernel tools. I think that's that's definitely doable. Uh, just someone needs to do it, or to send the patches to do it. But in principle, it, it's doable. I, just as a follow-up, that's, that's exactly what I'm doing at the moment, is I've, I've basically cloned the package out of boot, put it into my own BR2 external, so I'm then having to track the upstream changes that you're making in boot just to tweak the, the, the target DIR flags. So it would be nice if that was integrated a bit better. But I'm not a complete expert in build route, so I, I don't quite know how to start submitting some patches. But I'm, I'll take it offline and yeah, see yeah, what you've got to say. Yeah, please submit patches. We're, we're differently interested. Don't keep that, that kind of things um, on, on your side. It, it's much better if it can be upstreamed and, and maintained. Any other question? There's a question in the back. Thank you. Microphone is. Thank you. Since no more question, uh, let's back for question one. Uh, actually, what my day job usually is to build kernel myself, and then use build root to build image based on kernel out of tree. Mm -hmm. So could it be like extended this override source, but not using at all packages or whatever of what build root using, but using actually image uh, already, BZ, BZ image of kernel? Well, uh, the BZ image thing is it's, it is trivial. It's the trivial part. You can write the post build script that takes the BZ image from wherever you want in your file system that already exists and then put that into, um, into the 
target you know, that build root has created and, and spit out the file system image, that, that's really a one-line uh, post-build script. Um, where it gets more complicated is with scanner you know, modules, because you have to install them into the target, but that's possibly also doable with a post-build script as well, so with a little bit of integration um, and a short post-build script, I don't see why it, it wouldn't be possible. Well, uh, I'm using... Yeah, I've got a lot of lights uh, yeah. here, so I can't see you, but I can yeah, hear you. I'm using build root uh, quite for a long time, but uh, I, uh, I mean, actively in the mailing, mailing list, but uh, I have a question like, uh, can we directly use the Linux Next? Because uh, most of the patches in the Linux Next may not be in the stable version that you you are supported for the specific header files, right? headers, right? So uh, Bitroot does not enforce any kernel version. You have a field where you say which Git repository you want to use and which commit or tag you want to use. So you can use Linux Next, PreamptRT, your vendor-specific Git tree, whatever you want. There is nothing in 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 in, um, in, in Bitroot that really enforces you to use that specific kernel version. The only th place where I think we we may have that is. Um, the kernel headers, where by default we uh, just have a list of the stable kernels, but you have an option now where you can say, I want to use the same kernel headers as the kernel I'm building, in which case it will be your Linux next tree if that's the one you've chosen to build. Okay, thanks. Welcome. Okay, um, get the sign that's, that's, that's over. I will be around for the conference, and I will uh, uh, leave the microphone to Jan, who will also be talking about build root, so if you're interested by build root, you can uh, stay in the room. And again, I'll be around. Thank you for your attention.